Greetings from Mesa View United Methodist Church of Albuquerque, New Mexico. We hope this message will be meaningful and relevant to your life and your relationship with God. We invite you to join us for worship on Sunday mornings. Our traditional service is at 8.30 a.m. and at 11 a.m. we gather for contemporary worship. More information may be found at our website, mesaviewumc.com. Now may you be blessed through the reading and hearing of God's holy word. Our scripture reading this morning comes to us from 1 Timothy, beginning in the second chapter. I desire then that at every place the men should pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. Also that the women should dress themselves modestly and decently in suitable clothing, not with their hair braided or with gold, pearls, or expensive clothes, but with good works, as is proper for women who profess reverence for God. Let a woman learn in silence with full submission. I permit no woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She is to keep silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing, provided they continue in faith and love and holiness with modesty. This is the word of God for you and me, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today we continue looking at some of the difficult passages we find in Scripture as they relate to women. Last week we heard a passage from 1 Corinthians in which it said that women are to be silent in church. And I said that many scholars do not, do not believe that that was original to that passage, and it came in later through a, a scribal edition, probably some, from a margin notation, based upon that passage we just heard from 1 Timothy. So a brief summary, 20 minutes of last week's sermon in 10 seconds now. Scholars don't think it's original because it doesn't match what we find elsewhere, not only in the rest of Paul's writings, but elsewhere in 1 Corinthians and when Paul talks about women talking in church. The second reason is because it's not consistently found in the same place in our manuscripts, which sort of says that scribes weren't sure where this passage was supposed to go, so they put it into multiple places. And the third point is that if you take that section out of chapter 14, the passage actually reads smoother with it not there than it does where it is. Now, that doesn't mean it's not original. It could be that they just put it in the wrong place and it should be somewhere else in 1 Corinthians. Now, those who were here last week are probably saying, why didn't they just say that last week and we could have moved on rather than that longer sermon that we did cover? But that sort of leads us into today's passage. There's no doubt that this is original to this letter, but there is doubt that Paul actually wrote this. In fact, most scholars believe that what are known as the pastoral epistles, 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus, were not written by Paul. And when I say most scholars, I mean about 90% of scholars believe that these are written by somebody else, that they're pseudo-epigraphical. That's my $60,000 word for the day. Pseudo-epigrapha were fairly common in the ancient world. That's somebody writing in somebody else's name. And it was not normally done out of a sense of deceit. It was somebody who had studied with that person or they were a follower of them or somebody in their school of thought and said, if they were still alive at this point in time, this is what they would say about these issues. Now, this is not crucially important to this passage except for it's sort of my defense of Paul. As people often say, well, Paul says women should be silent in church, women should be subordinate to men. I don't think that Paul actually ever said that. So I'll be talking about 1 Timothy's author rather than re being referring to them as Paul himself. Now, the easiest thing to do with these passages would be to simply ignore them. Pretend like they don't exist and go off about other things. And the simple fact is we do that all the time. We even do it with that passage we just heard from 1 Timothy. So, for example, churches which do not allow women in leadership positions and certainly not to be members of the clergy don't require women to cover their heads when they come into worship, even though that's a rule given by Paul in 1 Corinthians. And they don't stop women at the door if their hair is braided and say, I'm sorry, you can't come into worship because you're violating the law from 1 Timothy, nor do they say if you're wearing gold or pearls or expensive clothes, you're not welcome. They choose to ignore those sets of rules, but then focus on that rule 
about women being subordinate to men. So why is that? Why do we ignore some rules and not others? Is it because we sometimes go to Scripture with our own biases looking for Scripture to back it up and ignore those pieces that don't back up our own biases? And the simple truth is we're all guilty of this. I'm not narrowing one group out over another. We all pick and choose what parts of Scripture we want to follow or make others follow in which we would like to ignore or simply explain away. And that even includes the author of 1 Timothy because he explains or justifies his reasoning about why women should be subordinate to men based upon the story we find about Adam and Eve. And he says that Adam was formed first and that Eve came from the rib of Adam, therefore she is subordinate, women are therefore subordinate to men. I think there's at least two major problems with that. The first is that when is the second release of a product ever worse than the first release? That is, you could say that Adam is sort of a beta test, and then God figures out all the quirks and all the things that are wrong and then begins to make women. The, the bigger problem, though, is actually a scriptural one. And that is that he quotes from Eve coming second being made after Adam is, which comes to us from the second creation story we find in the second chapter of Genesis. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to it right there at the beginning. And that's true for that story, but he consciously chooses to ignore the first creation story found in Genesis chapter 1. And in that story, when are man and woman created? At the same time. So he chooses the second creation story because it matches what he wants to say. It ignores the first creation story in which there's a sort of egalitarianism because man and woman are created at exactly the same time. So he picks and chooses what scripture he's going to use and which he's going to ignore. The second thing that he does is he conveniently twists the story of the fall found in the third chapter of Genesis in which Eve supposedly takes the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and then tempts Adam with it, and they cause the fall, and they're expelled from the garden. So he says that the, the woman is deceived, and she is the one who then leads to this downfall. But if you look in the third chapter of Genesis, again, turn your Bibles there and look through it, we find that Eve is talking to the serpent, not named Satan, that's something we've added in later, and she takes the fruit and she eats it. And then sort of popular mythology is that then Eve goes walking through the garden searching for poor, humble, naive Adam who has no idea what's about to happen to him. And she uses her feminine wiles and deceives him. And he takes the fruit and eats. But what the story actually says is Eve took the fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her. And he ate. That is, Adam's there the entire time. He's there when she begins the conversation with the serpent. He's there when she takes the fruit. He's there when she eats the fruit. And apparently he does nothing to stop it. Maybe he's just as deceived, if that's the word we want to use, as Eve is. But he's a willing participant in this. Eve doesn't sort of search him out and force him to do something against his own will. So we all pick and choose what scriptures we want to use and what arguments we want to use with them. But our original question, which began last week and continues today, is how do we approach this scripture with integrity and see a different meaning to it so we can engage with it and not just dismiss it altogether or ignore and pretend that it's not actually there? Do we have to read these passages the same way they were read in the first century? Or can we say that we exist in a different time, in a different place in the 21st century, and come to understand and interpret them differently? Now, fortunately for us as Methodists, we have a history and tradition that allows us greater freedom in latitude about how we approach Scripture because of the tradition that comes to us from John Wesley. Wesley, who is the founder of Methodism, said that we are to approach Scripture 
using tradition, experience, and reason. This has become to be known as the Wesleyan quadrilateral. And so sometimes you'll see a square with scripture, tradition, experience, and reason around the sides. I think that's incorrect because that says that all of those things are equal. I prefer more the metaphor of a three-legged stool. That scripture is the base upon we, which we sit, upon which our faith is based. But that stool, that seat, is supported by tradition, experience, and reason. And it was using this idea that Wesley was able to reinterpret the passages we have on slavery. Wesley was the first theologian of any significance to come out in opposition to slavery, not on economic grounds, which was the common argument in 18th century England, but on theological grounds. To say that Scripture appears to support slavery, but my experience of slavery from his perspective, especially in the American context, he came over to Georgia and saw it firsthand, didn't match with his understanding of who God was and what God was calling us to do and who God was calling us to be. And so he said, my experience and my reason allow me to see these passages of Scripture in a radically different way. The way that all the church sees it now. It just took most of the church more than 100 years to see it the way Wesley was originally interpreting it. So using that, what does our tradition, experience, and reason tell us about these passages related to women? Well, when we normally think about the tradition, we sort of see this 2,000-year history of women being subordinate within the church, not being able to serve in positions of leadership, certainly not being able to be in ordained clergy positions, and not just in the Roman Catholic Church, but in many of the Protestant traditions. And that goes right back to the beginning of Protestantism. Martin Luther said that a woman should remain at home, sit still, keep house, and bear and bring us children. If a woman grows weary and at last dies from childbearing, it matters not. Let her die from bearing. She is there to do it. That seems like sort of matching what 1 Timothy just said, that women earn salvation by bearing children. That seems what's held up as part of the tradition, except that the tradition is much deeper and more complex than that. While Jesus chose 12 men to be his disciples, it's very clear from Scripture that there were women followers, that there were women who were financially supporting Jesus, that there were women who were incredibly important in Jesus' ministry, that it was the women who were there on Good Friday when all the disciples had abandoned them. It was women who were there on the tomb on Easter Sunday. The women were the first ones to encounter the risen Christ. And it was women who were told by Jesus first to go and tell the disciples what they had seen. Now in Scripture, an apostle is one who is sent, normally by Christ, to go out into the world. Normally, an apostle is also one who has encountered the risen Christ. So by that standard, women are the first apostles of the church. They not only encounter the risen Christ, but Christ says, go and tell the standard for who an apostle is. We also know that women were involved in lots of other ways in the church. We have them not only in Paul's writings of talking about women who not only support him financially, but are leading some of the house churches that he has established, but in his letter to the Romans, the last chapter, again, turn your Bible to the last chapter of, of Romans, he greets people there in Rome. Paul himself has not be yet been to Rome. And he says some of the people he knows and some he doesn't. Of the ten that Paul sort of only indirectly knows, two of them are women and eight are men. But of those he addresses in Romans that Paul himself knows, nine are men and eight are are women. That is that Paul routinely works with a large percentage of women in the church in key leadership positions. We also have correspondence from around the year 120 between the Emperor Trajan and Pliny, who's the governor of a region of the Roman Empire. And Pliny has arrested the leaders of this Christian community and interrogated them, tortured them to find out what it is that they're doing. Does anybody want to make a guess who the leaders of this Christian community are? Women. They're women. They're slave women, actually. 
So it, it's, women play an important role in the early church. And I think what we see here in this passage from 1 Timothy, what we see in that addition to 1 Corinthians, is that as every movement gains in popularity and begins to spread, it wants to begin to form, conform to the acceptable practices of the culture in which it finds itself. And so I believe that in the early church, women played key roles, but as it began to spread and grow in, within the Roman Empire, where women were not in key positions, were not allowed to do things, in which women were not allowed to engage in politics, had to be silent, that the church began to take on those characteristics so that they could be respectable, so that they would fit in within culture and people wouldn't think that they were strange and doing strange things. And I think that because we see exactly the same thing happening in the early Methodist movement. Several women came to John Wesley and said that they, they believed that they had been called by God to become ministers of the gospel. And John, being a man of his age, wasn't really sure what to do with them and probably would have dismissed them, except he talked to his mother. And Susanna, his mother, was a powerhouse in and of her own right, who was incredibly important in his upbringing, as were his sisters, who were all older than he was. He saw that she was a much better minister and pastor to the congregation that she was involved with than his father was, who was the pastor of that church. And she said, the way you can tell if they're called by God or not is by their fruits. If they preach and people come to Christ, God called them. And if they preach and no one comes to Christ, they're not called by God. The same standard you would set for men who are preaching for you. And so John began allowing women to come in as exhorters. There were no ordained clergy yet in the movements. But as Methodism began to spread and to get bigger and to draw in more people from the middle class and the upper class and they wanted to be more respectable, women began to be excluded. And those who had been invited in as exhorters were pushed out and no one else was invited back in, no other women. It wouldn't be until 1956 that the Methodist Church fully ordained female clergy. The first females ordained in the New Mexico Annual Conference didn't come until the 80s. And many of them left the conference or the denomination because of the opposition they experienced to them leading congregations. Now, I've been truly blessed to know many female clergy in my time and helped me enormously in my development as minister. So one of my stoles is up here on the table. This was given to me by my internship pastor, Reverend Johanna Dane, and it comes from her mother, who was also an ordained uh, Methodist clergy, one of the first ever ordained in the church. And so I wear this with pride when I do wear it, remembering the struggles and the strife that they faced and the blessings that they have given to me in my own ministry. And I know the female clergy who have served and come out of this congregation, I know that many of you have been blessed as well. But these these traditions and these prejudices have deep roots, and they go a long way back, but the tradition is not as black and white as many would like to make it to believe. Now, but what about our reason and our experience? What do they say to us in interpreting these passages? Well, so here's a quarter. Both sides of the quarter are different, right? But there's just one quarter. We sort of look at men and women being the same way. We're humans, and one side is female, one side is male. Two sides of the coin. They're different, and the French would say, vive la différence, but and yet they're somehow still the same. There's something unique about them. But even the biggest misogynists I know would, would make that argument. They wouldn't say that women are less than human. But that's how they would have been viewed in the ancient world. They sort of had a hierarchy of how things existed, starting at the lowest amoeba level, and then going up to the gods being the highest level. And just underneath the gods were men. And then underneath men were women and children. Not as humans, they're subhuman. Men are humans. Actually, Plato said only men have souls. And Aristotle said that women are defective by nature. 
That is that we all start out, he was actually right on this, we all start out the same in utero, and then there's a gender differentiation. But what Aristotle argued is that women weren't good enough to become men in utero. That's why they were women. In the Gospel of Thomas, a non-canonical text, which is supposedly a collection of Jesus' sayings, the last statement in that about Mary Magdalene, Jesus is supposed to have said, Look, I will guide to make her male, for every female who makes herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. That is, in order to enter eternal life, you had to be male. Now, I don't think that's original or authentic statement of Jesus, but it illustrates how men and women were viewed in the ancient world. It's not that they were one part of the same whole, just different. It's that they were entirely different, not even of the same piece. So regardless of where we stand on the issue, we all view men and women differently than they were viewed in the ancient world. And thus, I think we have to interpret these passages differently, the same way we interpret passages on slavery differently. Things change, realities change, and when that happens, laws change. Even God's laws change to different realities. We'll see that next week when we look at the remarkable story of Zelophehad's daughters in the book of Numbers. So these passages might have made sense in a first century context, but do they make sense in a 21st century context? All right, so you've already answered for me. I don't believe they do either. And so I believe that our interpretation has to change with time, that we use experience, tradition, and reason to support Scripture and to look at Scripture. And so then rather than just ignoring these passages or pretending that they don't exist, we approach them with integrity. And we simply say, we're going to look at them differently because we know more today. We understand things differently than they did in the first century. And then rather than saying we're going to ignore those rules about you know, braided hair and what clothing, but we're going to focus on women being silent, we're going to interpret all of those things differently. Now, I was reading something this week, and this person was talking about the difficulty of keeping fidelity to Scripture amongst the seduction of certitude. The difficulty of keeping fidelity to Scripture amongst the seduction of of certitude. That is, we want things to be black and white. We certainly want certitude when it comes to Scripture. We want it to say what it means and mean what it says. But it doesn't often do that. And so we, we get seduced into trying to find certitude that's not there. And that seduction is just as dangerous as all the other seductions we have going on in the world. But I think we can remain faithful to Scripture while not having the certitude that we might desire. Because what certitude tries to do is it tries to force God into a box. Say, we understand exactly who God is and what God wants, and we're going to crush God into that and God's Word, into that little container, more often so that we can be in control of it, but because we want to be certain about things. But the problem is God has this unique habit of busting out of boxes, of moving beyond, way beyond our certitudes, beyond our desire to control things, way beyond our desire to see others as beloved children of God. And we can either be open to God blowing out that box, or we can try to crush God into that box. Because one of the ways that God blew out the box was with Jesus. Lots of people weren't ready to see that box being changed, and Jesus didn't fit into their box. And lots of people still don't see Jesus fitting into that box. So I'm not saying we throw away these passages or we just ignore them. I'm saying let's read them and just be honest and say we're going to interpret them differently because we live in a different world than they lived in in the first century. That we're going to read them in our context, understanding what their context was as well. To see the movement of God in a whole new light. To see God's radiant glory and mercy and love in a whole new light. So that we draw circles rather than just excluding people, 
that we draw circles that include everybody. Because I think that's how God draws God's circles. Because it says, these are all my beloved children. And they're all included in there. And then we're going to judge each other, not on outward characteristics, not by biological features. We're going to judge each other by the fruits of our labor. Because that's what I read Jesus saying, is that we'll be judged by the fruits. So on this third Sunday of Easter, we remember that it was the women who went to the tomb, who were still there being faithful to Jesus. That they were the first ones to encounter the risen Christ. That they were the first ones to make the proclamation that Christ was risen. That Christ said, go and tell to the women. And so we celebrate that witness of the women in Scripture. And we celebrate the witness of the women throughout the history of the church who have made a difference in people's lives, who continue to make a difference in our lives, most especially for those women who are told that they don't belong. I pray that it will be so, my brothers and sisters. Amen.